Well, good morning, Airborne Church. Well, thanks. That's, hey, hey. I can tell you guys right now, I am so excited for today's message. I'm so excited for what God put on my heart. And um, I just want to ready your spirits. I just want to help prepare you and kind of clear the path for you to, to just know that um, God wants to do something in your life today. I truly believe that. God wants to liberate you today. And so the first step into that is you being open to receiving that. So before I get into this, let's pray. God, right now, I just pray that you open up our hearts, God. Allow us to be bold. Allow us to be courageous. Allow us to really lean in to the word that you have planned. I know that this will do something for someone that they're in dire need of. And I just pray that your will is upon them in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, guys, um, one of my personal hobbies, one of my passions, um, I really enjoy to go to the gym. I do. Uh, I like to work out. I like to go to the gym. It refreshes me. It replenishes me. It's good for me, not only physically, but also mentally. It's just good for my spirit. And a particular type of workout that I'll do at the gym sometimes is I'll do chain workouts, chain workouts. And what that means to just help some people out is it's just, it actually, it's just, it is what it is. It's working out with a big chain, uh, whether that is being on a, a flat bench press. I'm not going to do an example right now for you because one, I don't have a bench press, but it's basically you can put chains on each end of the bar and you can press the weight from there, adding more weight to it. But more so than that, you can put a chain around your neck, a big, heavy chain around your neck and run, do exercises, do some ropes. I'm telling you, it can really put the weight on. These chains would always make it so hard to move, let alone work out. But that's something a chain would do, isn't it? Right? Make things harder, weigh you down, keep you from going anywhere. The physical chains, though, listen, the physical chains that I've worked out with are completely immeasurable compared to the weight of the chains that God has put on my heart to talk about this morning. This morning, I'm not going to talk about actual physical chains for working out. I want to talk about a chain, chains, if you will, that outweigh anything of physical nature. I want to talk to you about the internal chains that have kept you captive for far too long. Those chains, they consist of three things. And I want to let you know ahead of time what these three things are before I really get into the body of the message. The chain of envy, the chain of shame, and the chain, the chain of fear. Envy, shame, and fear. My hope and my prayer for you this morning is that you will find courage, strength, and power to break free from the chains that bind you. Can we believe for that this morning? But like I said at the beginning of the message, you have to be willing to receive that. So you might be sitting in here this morning and you might think to yourself, oh my gosh, like, that's me. All it takes is that willingness to say, that's me. The boldness to say, yeah, that's me. And God can liberate you. The binding chains. Envy. Envy invites madness. Envy invites madness. An envious heart is a fast and deadly poison that leads to self-deterioration. It leads to self-deterioration. It destroys you from the inside out. The Bible has a prime example of someone who struggled with such a heart. This man was known as Saul. 
and he was the first king of Israel. Now, when Saul was anointed the first king of Israel, God had his hand on the matter. By Samuel the prophet, he was anointed by oil and bestowed the next king of Israel. And Saul had all the makings of that king, big, strong, brave, bold. But through time, Saul started to make some bad choices. Through time, Saul started to disobey God, to walk away from that call, the obedience of the Lord. And one too many times put Saul in a position where God had readied a next vessel in David to be the next king of Israel. So when this was all kind of taking place, when Saul had lost favor from the Lord and David was the next man up, this had a heavy impact on Saul. Saul started to become envious of David. Saul started to see that God's favor was leaving him and going to another. But I'm called to be the king of Israel. That's me. That's my job. You you gave that to me, God. Saul, you weren't listening to me. You weren't obedient to the words that I was giving you, to the call that I put on your heart. You went AWOL. And as this was all taking place, Saul began to go crazy of envy. There's a story in the Bible about Saul and the medium. Now, picture this. Early on, when Saul was still in favor, when Saul was still in God's good graces, his reign as king, he had a law that he, he did. But before envy kicked in, Saul had declared a law that forbid any form of witchcraft in the land and banished all who practiced the stuff. Remember, this is before the envy kicked in. He had this courageous, bold law saying, my God says we can't practice witchcraft. So anyone who does this, they need to go. You've been evicted, you're gone. Hit the fast forward button for a second. David is the new guy at bat with God's blessing. Hit the fast forward button a little bit. Saul is slowly becoming the mad king of Israel. And through all that envy and that growth and the, the, the pain and the struggle, one night after all this envy had built up, Saul sends out his men to look for one of these mediums one of these mediums that he had originally casted out due to the unholy practice. That's already kind of confusing, isn't it? Well, hold on. Um, But Saul, I mean, like if I'm one of the soldiers, I'm thinking, well, Saul, hold on. Like we have a law that you said we're not supposed to do that stuff in the kingdom, but you're the boss. I'm going to do what you say. Get this. When his men did find someone who fit the bill, this man saw himself, even went all the way of disguising himself in his own kingdom. He's in his kingdom. He's the king of the kingdom, and he's disguising himself in the middle of the night to meet with this medium and take part in the very thing that he stood against. You said it was banned. You said you, you made a law. You said your God doesn't allow it. But now you're taking part in the very thing that you stood against. Isn't it something that when we start to let envy take control of our minds and hearts, we start to lose sight of our own morals and what we actually stand for? It's amazing. It's terrifying and amazing all at once because that's the power of envy. That is the poisonous effect caused by envy. I'm here to tell you, replace an envious heart with a grateful heart. An envious heart will never find peace of mind, but a heart that is grateful will always find fulfillment. It will always find fulfillment. You will always have enough. You'll never be seeking more with a grateful heart. Honestly, a lot of times you'll probably be looking, how, how can I give more? When's the last time you simply thank God for what you do have? 
Psalm 107 one says, give thanks to the Lord for he is good. It doesn't say give thanks to the Lord if I get that promotion like he did. It doesn't say give thanks to the Lord if I get the car that I want like they have. It doesn't say if. You hearing me? It says give thanks to the Lord for he is good. Envy. And then shame. Shame keeps you hidden in the shadows. The chains of shame have a strategic way of keeping its captives isolated and alone. Think about it. A natural reaction to shame, or in other terms, embarrassment, is to evade or avoid people. Like, like oh my gosh, I, I can't let her see me because like, she knows this about me, or I can't, I'm, not, I'm gonna go the long way because if I go that way, I know I'm gonna see him, and then they're gonna be like, oh, that's that guy. Like, that's a natural reaction to shame and embarrassment. It's, it's, a, it's kind of cool if you think about it. Like, a fun fact, studies show that a person's first experience of shame comes within the time frame of 15 to 24 months of age. It's a little toddler. But you see, at that age, it typically comes across as sweet or innocent. It's just a little toddler making a mistake. Just like hiding, its, hiding his face or her face or running behind mom and dad. And it's cute. And it's like, oh, yeah, they're just kids. However, as we get older, we start to see the serious effects of actual isolation due to our shame. We have even found crucial connections of shame being a direct initiate to depression. And so we hide our shame when we hide our shame, it gives depression an opportunity to set in, which can lead to even deeper isolation and loneliness. Hear me out when I tell you that people need people. Let me hear you say it. People, one more time, say people, people. Need, people. need people. Remember that, all right? And there are people in your world that want to help you and be there for you, but some of you have become experts at hiding in your shame. Anyone ever play hide and seek? Yeah, just me? Yeah. I played hide and seek growing up a lot. Uh, I played hide and seek as a college student. Um, anyone else play as a college student? That one, okay, cool. I, I understand not that many on that one. But me and my friends, we'd oftentimes play manhunt, and that's hide and seek in the dark. And there was a particular guy who was like really good at manhunt, uh, Nate Stevens, you might know him. And he's a daredevil. And one night we were all playing manhunt and we were at my house and everyone was found except for one person. It was, it was Nate. We couldn't find him. And we were done playing. Game was over. We we're done. <laughs> and we, we couldn't find Nate and we're looking around and we're, it's 20 minutes past and we're like, you know what? He's, okay. he's probably okay. He's okay. He's a tough guy, outdoorsman. Uh, he's Ron Stevens' son, so um, he'll be fine. Uh, so what did we do? We couldn't find him. We went inside to play a board game. And we didn't tell him because he wasn't around. Um, so we went inside and we played probably like a full game of Monopoly. And you guys know how Monopoly goes. We couldn't find Nate. Um, but what felt like an hour passes by and Nate comes inside and he goes, hey, when did we stop playing? <laughs> well, an hour and 20 minutes ago, Nate, uh, he was hiding in a tree. What? I'm not climbing up any tree. But think about this, okay? Some of you have become experts at hiding in your shame so much that no one even knows that you need found. And believe me when I say that there are people who want to help pull you out of that shame, but you have to come out of your hiding and let someone know that you've been lost in your own darkness. In order to break free from the shadows, you have to step out into the light. And it's not that people leave you behind. Hear me, if you struggle with shame this morning, it's not that people are leaving you behind, but you're not giving us any signs that you've been left behind. You're not letting us know, you're not letting your mom or your dad or that brother or sister or that close friend know I'm struggling within myself and I can't get out of it because you've, been an, you've become an expert at hiding in that shame. 
Can I tell you that people need people? You need somebody to lean on and to love on and to be loved on by. Shame keeps you hidden in the shadows. And then there's fear. And then there's fear. Fear creates boundaries that surround your freedom. Fear creates boundaries that surround your freedom. Let me tell you, fear is probably the most binding chain of all. Anxiety, insecurity, depression, they're all products produced by fear. And that's just three. There's a lot more than three that fear produces. Fear wants to put your courage in shackles. In those moments when you feel like you can do something, fear wants to tell you that you can't. Not only that you can't, but you never will. Fear. Fear attempts to speak without hesitation. Fear shouts, who do you think you are? Fear whispers, what makes you think you're qualified? Fear declares you powerless. Fear scoffs that you have no worth. Fear. Fear. Wants to confine you and keep you from stepping into the plans that God has for you. Fear. Somebody needs to hear this. If you want to step into your freedom, you need to be ready to step through your fear. You need to be ready to step through your fear. Bible tells us that the enemy, the devil himself, is like a prowling lion stalking his prey. Fear will try to take your joy will try to take your family. It's gonna try to take your hope. Don't let that happen. Don't let fear dictate your life. And the team can come out. It breaks my heart. It really does. It breaks my heart when I think about um, how heavy the chains of envy, shame, and fear can have on a person. I've seen it in my family. I've seen it in my friends. I've seen it in my own life. And I know I'm not the only one who can say that. I know that I'm not the only one that can say that. You know, as I readied my heart for this morning, I really tried to um, seek God and say, my God, what is it that you have for your people? And I, I can honestly tell you that this message that I've been planning for this morning has gone from one spectrum to another. And me, you can ask Emily, I am quite indecisive and I go all over the place. And if I'm in the middle of a drive-thru, I ask the person in the drive-thru, what should I get? I don't know, bro, like chicken sandwich? That's what I'll get. But you know, there are some things in life we can't be indecisive on. Can we stand? Can, will you stand with me this morning, church? I, I'm here to tell you that there's an antidote to envy. There's an outlet from shame. There's a promise that fights back fear. 
That answer lies in the powerful and the profound name of who? Jesus. I promise you it's Jesus. Speaking the name of Jesus gives you what you need to break free from the chains that bind you. I'm gonna say it again. Speaking the name of who? Jesus gives you exactly what you need to break free from the chains that bind you this morning. Isaiah 40, 29 through 31 says this, He gives strength to those who are tired. He gives power to those who are weak. Even the young wear out, even the best of them trip and fall. But those who trust in the Lord will receive new strength. They will fly as high as eagles. They will run and not get tired. They will walk and not grow weary. Can I tell you, when you speak the name of Jesus, there's a supernatural power that fills your body, that fills your spirit. But guess what? Not only you, but those around you. This morning we sang, I speak the name of Jesus. And I couldn't help but look around and see all the hands up in the room. And I thought to myself, that's what the power of Jesus does. You may even come into this room and think to yourself, I'm not raising my hands today. I'm not doing that. She's gonna be there. She's gonna watch me raise my hand. She's gonna judge me by the way I put my hand in the air. Stop, stop. When we give glory to the name of Jesus, big things happen. Can I get an amen? There is power in his name. It's time to get back to speaking the name of Jesus. Speak the name of Jesus against afflictions of envy. Speak the name of Jesus against the shadows of shame. Speak Jesus against the binding chains of fear. Speak Jesus into your marriage. Speak Jesus into your mother, brother, sister, father, grandparents. Speak Jesus to the holy name, the holy name of Jesus over your life. Can you speak Jesus over depression? Can you speak Jesus over anxiety? Somebody take this out of the way. I'm going to take it down. Can you speak Jesus in the times of trouble? Can you speak Jesus, thank you Lenny, over your family? Can you speak Jesus against fear? Come on, Airborne Church. Can you speak Jesus this morning? Can you speak Jesus this morning? Come on, Airborne Church.